We all recognise the face. I mean, how could we forget? Fifteen years after the Port Arthur massacre, that photo of Martin Bryant still sends a shiver down the spine. Nowadays, we like to think that his eyes are a little crazy, and that expression is ever so slightly off kilter. But that's all in hindsight. The fact is, apart from being a bit troubled as a kid and intellectually limited, really, Martin Bryant could be anyone's son. But he just happens to be Carlene Bryant's son, and the burden of that has been devastating for her. Carlene Bryant is tormented by the same questions that trouble us all. What made a seemingly ordinary, if dim-witted, young man go out and kill 35 people? And have we learned anything from that dreadful day? Today, Martin Bryant lives here, inside the walls of Risdon Prison on the outskirts of Hobart. He is serving 35 life sentences, 1,035 years without parole, cast into outer darkness and banished from society forever. His only visitor is his mother, Carlene. Martin is in jail. He will never be free, will he? No. Who will visit him when you're no longer around? Probably nobody. I'm the only person who visits at the moment. What's his physical condition today? He's overwe overweight. He's a man into Too his much 40s. overweight, mainly from lack of... through the medication, which puts weight on, and also lack of exercise. And his psychological condition, his mental state, what's he like? That's confidential. Um, I'm, even if I knew, I couldn't talk about it. All I can say is that... But Martin was diagnosed about three years ago as having Asperger's syndrome. Um, and he's happy where he is at the moment. Carleen Bryant is difficult to interview. A softly spoken woman who has arguably been as damaged by the events of that day as many of the survivors. I felt at the time that because I'm Martin's mother, I was being held accountable in some way for all these crimes. People up here. It was a killing rampage that ranks among the deadliest of the 20th century. On the 28th of April 1996, Martin Bryant walked into the Broad Arrow Cafe at the historic Port Arthur site and opened fire with a semi automatic rifle. Yeah, right, about three more shots, five. Bryant was arrested at the scene and shortly after he confessed. At the time, Carlene Bryant and her son's lawyer encouraged him to plead guilty to alleviate enormous amounts of public pain. But in her recently published book, she now claims beyond belief that her son isn't guilty and the evidence against him was never tested at a trial. But are you really saying that you think if he'd had a trial, although you convinced him to plead guilty, he might have got off? Well, yes. Is that because a... Martin? Martin always, when he was questioned, um, probably for weeks after, before I saw him again, um, he always said he was never in Port Arthur at Broad Arrow. And you believed him? Yes. There's no but, evidence but none that of, Martin was there. There's... But none of that was needed because Martin said in court, yes, I did it, and you went along with it. Exactly. And now you wish you hadn't. Of course, I'll, I'll, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. A lot of people on that day uh, came forward after and who, people who knew Martin had known Martin for years and they said, as far as they were concerned... They didn't recognise the gunman as being Martin Bryant. 
So many people would be very upset to hear you deny that this happened as people understand it happened. What do you say to them? But there's also a lot of people that realise that Martin didn't have a trial and that the, there was no, no evidence uh, proven whether he was the gunman. But did you ever get the chance to ask him, did you do it, son? Did you ask him that? I did, but and I didn't get any answer. And then after that he doesn't want to see you? No, you... that's right. Because he's frightened I'm going to ask questions. Whatever else people say about you, you're a loyal mother. I am, sure. I know there'll be a lot of people out there that'll be condemning me for even coming on this program, but I, I want to be able to help Martin. Oh. To have to live uh, with uh, what one's child has done and what has happened to one's child as a result uh, must be a terrible burden. Um, and one has to find, I suppose, some way of surviving. Paul Mullen can understand a mother's misguided love, but he also knows the truth. As Australia's leading forensic psychiatrist, he was the first to hear Bryant recount the massacre. One of the odd things uh, about a job like mine is I spend my time talking uh, with people who have done terrible things. Uh, what you find are not monsters. Uh, but flawed human beings. You spent how many hours with him? Quite a lot. And it is very difficult. Uh, it, this was a terrible time in Australia. I think it affected all of us very deeply. But to do my job, uh, you still have to get through that and relate uh, to the human being in front of you. A, a troubled, intellectually limited, sad, pathetic man who had done something unforgivable. Will you ever see him again? I don't think he would want to see me again. All the people that are dead are in the cafeteria and around the bus. He actually shot people on the bus. I need to disregard them. One of the cars came back. Port Arthur was a black day for the entire nation and a lingering horror for those who were there. I know that you tend not to talk about that dreadful day 15 years ago, mm -hmm. but you must think about it a lot, even now. Oh, well, a, a, a day, day never goes by, boy, that you don't think about it. Vera Jari and Coralie Lever were on holiday together with their husbands at the wrong time and the wrong place. Their men, Ron and Dennis, were ordinary blokes who turned out to be heroes. They died shielding their wives from the hail of bullets. Dennis thought it was a reenactment, actually, and went to, talk, uh, to walk away, and that's when Den pushed me to the floor when he started shooting again. And, um, and protected you? And protected, yeah, very much so, yeah. And at the same time, your bloke was doing the same thing for you? Mm. We were a little bit of distance away, but the same thing happened there. Mm. Yeah. But Dennis didn't um, move from where he was standing, actually. He was, uh, he was shot there. Three or four people dead that were covered up near the buses. He still doesn't communicate a lot, does he? He doesn't talk about the events. No, he doesn't. He's never talked about them. Would you like him to? Yeah, for, for sure. But in Martin Bryant's childhood were the signs of what was to come. Despite her denial, his mother's recollections of her young son might, in retrospect, reveal the first fateful steps to Port Arthur. Because he couldn't entertain himself, um, we'd often find toys that were broken. Uh, at a very young age, that was. What, broken in temper or...? Yeah, I don't know whether temper and frustration. 
Martin was different, I'll put it that way, but uh, as far as abusing people and being nasty, no. How is it that your view is so different from the one that has been so widely reported? Well, I mean, I'm his mother. I know what he was like. Uh, yes, he was annoying, uh, like most boys are, with, especially with their sisters. But um, as, as, as he got older and Lindy started bringing a few friends home, or they would ring her up, he started turning very nasty towards them. Um, and what the, form did that take? He just shouted at them and tell them not to ring anymore uh, and abuse them if they came there to the house. Did you have any sense of foreboding that this kind of behaviour could get worse? Not until the psychiatrist told us. They said he would never ever be able to hold a position down um, simply because he would aggravate people to such an extent that he'd always be in trouble. Martin Bryant first came to public notice in 1979 when he was interviewed after an accident with fireworks. Try, I broke the stick trying to get out, but I couldn't, and it made a hole through my jeans. Despite a serious injury, he displays the characteristic inappropriate behaviour which was much later diagnosed as Asperger's syndrome. Do you think you'll be playing with firecrackers anymore? Yes. Don't you think you've learned a lesson from this? Yes, but I'm still playing with it. Fireworks aside, Bryant's was the unnoticed and lonely childhood of an individual unable to make friends. Until finally, at 19, he met Helen Harvey, the rich, middle-aged, eccentric heiress to the Tattersall's lottery fortune. Uh, Helen was a very eccentric person. Martin was looking for work at the time. She was battling to, to work and, and maintain and keep the cats and the dogs, about 40 cats fed and cleaned and, and about 14 dogs or more. Uh, Were you a bit horrified by this manager? So yes, yeah, sure, she needed some help. So they seemed to click straight away and they were almost inseparable. So this was a friendship, was a very good friendship, definitely. but not, not a sexual no, relationship. No, definitely not. It was like mother and son because Helen, Helen was 52 at the time and she'd never ever married. In the chronicle of misfortune that dogged Martin Bryant's early life, Helen Harvey died in a car crash. And then fate struck again when his father, Morris, the only man he could ever talk to committed suicide. Ah, uh, well, once again, Martin lost one of his, well, the last of his close friends. Not long after Helen. Not that. long after Helen. He was absolutely devastated. I mean, how would Morris have possibly handled what happened a bit later? Well, I don't believe it would have happened. But the events that might have triggered the slayings at Port Arthur happened a world away. Even Martin Bryant, who's a, who's a very dim human being, uh, knew a lot about the massacre at Dunblane, for example. Just six weeks before Port Arthur, at Dunblane, a small town in the south of Scotland, a gunman killed 16 schoolchildren and one adult. The first thing is that almost all of these mass killings uh, start off with a project for suicide. So these people intend to die amongst their victims. They want to be remembered as powerful, terrible, evil monsters. Martin Bryant seems to tick most of those yep, boxes. Martin Bryant had all of that. The final thing about them is they're following a script. What these people want to do is die in a terrible blaze of publicity. They don't want to finish up in prison, in, a, in psychiatric hospitals, being exposed as the pathetic failures that they actually are. Determined that life should go on, 
Coralie Leifer is now a leading member of the Australian Bravery Association, which promotes the recognition of everyday heroes. It's the best thing I've ever done, and I can help other people, and that's what's that's what warms the heart. You can um, makes you feel good when when you can help others, and this is what I want to get across and say there is a life there, but maybe different um, to what you planned, but there is a life, and it's what you make it. Incidentally, the world is still a beautiful place. It is. It certainly is. Since she's written and spoken out, people might tend to blame her now. Can you attach blame to the parent of, I think of someone like feel, Martin no, Bryant? Not in the least. You just have to feel sorry for her. It's irrational, of course, but testament to the maternal bond that a parent can cling to love in the face of such a monstrous truth. Though deeply damaged, Carlene Bryant has somehow found a way to carry a burden that no mother should have to bear. Well, for, for many, many years, I was in fear of, of walking out, on, out of my door onto the street, in fear of, of who would recognise me. I was always looking over my shoulder to see if I could, if people would recognise me as being Martin's mother. Uh, but since then, people have said, you go out, you hold your head high, you've got nothing to be ashamed of. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching. To keep up with the latest from 60 Minutes Australia, make sure you subscribe to our channel. You can also download the Nine Now app for full episodes and other exclusive 60 Minutes content.